in the book of Matthew. We've been looking at uh, the Sermon on the Mount, or specifically in the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 8 this morning, but to just kind of get there and set up the context, let's um, start reading again at verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And here's this week's verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, in just that one sentence, there is so much going on um, for us to be able to try to wrap our minds and our hearts around what is being said here. Um, and I spent some time this week thinking about just what is, what is the best way to try to present this and like kind of from this angle or that angle or the other angle and um, there's different ways to look at this but I guess for this morning I want to start off this way that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God number one in your outline I want to talk about the prize the prize is seeing God and that's the prize here we're going to talk about being pure in heart and what that means but the prize for the pure in heart is they see God this is why they're blessed. Blessed are the people that are approved, for they shall see God. They're, they're, they're happy in the Lord. They're going to see God. This idea of seeing God, this is quite the prize. This is quite a thing. If you remember what it was like in the Old Testament, no one could see God in all his glory and live. Now, this is one of those things that sometimes people want to poke at the Bible and go, oh, there's contradictions. There's not contradictions when it's correctly understood. What happens when someone thinks there's a contradiction, they haven't really understood what it's saying. And this is one of those areas because they want to say, well, wait a second. It says that nobody can see God live, and yet there are people that saw God and lived. Exactly. They saw him, but they couldn't see him in all his glory. Let me have you turn back to the book of Exodus. Exodus. And you're going to see this all together in one passage. So the writer knows what he's doing. He's not contradicting himself. And it, the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. Scripture explains itself. And the Holy Spirit within us, who authored this, helps us understand. Exodus 33. And I want you to read verses 1 to 11 because... There's going to be a development here as we go along with this idea of seeing God. Um, look at verses 1 to 11 of Exodus 33. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land to, of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. The people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until... He had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. How amazing is that? And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses 
face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. So here it says Moses is speaking with God face to face. That's amazing. But we're about to find out that it may have been face to face, but even in that form, God has somehow, if you will, um, veiled himself or limited Moses being able to see him in all his glory. Because skip down in the same chapter to verse 18, actually 17. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. So before he'd seen, he'd seen God face to face, but now we're finding out it wasn't face to face in all his glory because man can't see him and live. Verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So this idea then in the Old Testament, if you can't see God in all his glory and live, uh, you'll see this throughout uh, the Old Testament. For example, in Genesis 32, uh, 22 to 32, um, in, well, specifically Genesis 32, 30, let me turn there, Jacob has wrestled and he comes to realize he's been wrestling with God. And in Exodus 32, 30, he says this. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Yet my life has been delivered. What you're going to see as we go through some of these passages is, when these people encounter God and they see him, there is no doubt in their mind I have seen God and they're scared <laughs> you can't see God in all his glory and live but what's interesting is you can't see God in all his glory and live yet when they see him he is so glorious even in the limited way he's letting them see him even in that limited way he is so glorious that there is no doubt in their mind they saw God and they're either scared that they're gonna die or they're amazed that they didn't die and even then it's not seeing him at his best if you will um, turn over to the, the book of uh, Judges, Judges 13.22, and you'll see the story of Samson's parents. And the Lord appears to them as the angel of the Lord. And Judges 13.22. An amazing story. In fact, back up just for a second, just because of the shock and awe of this story. Um, the uh, Lord has appeared to them as the angel of the Lord. Um, look at verse 19. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now amounts, amounts to us such things as these. Again, they have this encounter and they see him in this form, God, in the form of the angel of the Lord. And there's something so glorious about him, what he just sees when he gets in the fire and whatever happens there, and that's, he knows I've seen God. And he's scared he's going to die, and yet he hasn't seen God in all his glory. But turn to Isaiah, towards the middle of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 6. An awe-inspiring passage. 
passage. Isaiah 6. And start in um, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, the train of his robe, I mean, it, it's not, a, you know, obviously a locomotive train <laughs> doing that kind of thing. Funny things that are just the way the English language works and the way words change and depend on their uh, spelling and stuff. But it's the idea of the train of his robe. If you ever saw, um, I think the illustration I heard someone used to illustrate this was, uh, it was a royal wedding. And the way the... the, the the princess or the way the ladies dress just like float out the back. Well, this isn't a dress because he's, you know, the Bible uses masculine pronouns for the Lord, but it's the train of his robe. It's, it's all that excess, if you will. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Do you get it? He's going, I just saw the Lord of hosts. Woe is me, because I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips. He knows his sin, and he's just seen a glimpse of Jesus and the glory of Jesus. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hands a burning coal that he had taken from the tong with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your, heart, your guilt is taken away. And your sin atoned for. There's a, it's a symbolic act there because touching the lips, the purity of the lips indicates purity of the heart. Because what does Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What had just happened here? Isaiah had repented of his sin. But again, you see this fear of seeing. The, the, do we want to see God? Absolutely. And yet when they see him, they're scared. And they're afraid they're going to die. They know no one can see God in all his glory and live. They're seeing him not in all his glory, but it's still so glorious. It's the most glorious thing they've ever seen. And they think, I'm, I'm going to die. Or they're amazed that they haven't. So this prize of telling us, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is a wonderful thing. This is an amazing thing. To have this promise made to you and me, that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, there's a problem there, though, isn't there? The second thing is this. The problem is our sin. Because it says it's the pure in heart that see God. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. Verse 10 says to give every man according to his ways according to the fruit of his deeds and on our own our deeds aren't enough are they we've all sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of God none of us on our own is pure in heart so blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God the problem is on our own we're not pure in heart so how will we ever see God? I remember, the Lord has blessed me with a good memory of childhood. And I can remember even, even as a child, sin that I would struggle with and things. And realizing, okay, I need saving. Like, I, I have sinned, right? On our own, we are all desperately wicked. That's why we need a Savior. That's number three, the path. Our Savior, Jesus. Our Savior, Jesus. It's, our, it's Jesus who comes and, first of all, shows us the Father. Look at some verses from the book of John. Jesus comes and he helps us see the Father. 
Because, you see, there's kind of this poetic thing here. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But if I'm going to ever have a pure heart, there's some things I need to see about God first, right? It's kind of like seeing this much of God in order to become pure in heart and then see more of God. And so Jesus comes on the scene, John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Notice, we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, Jesus comes and we see the glory isn't just bright lights or thick smoke. It isn't just an overwhelming voice. Glory is the word, Jesus. And he's full of grace. And he's full of truth. And he shows us the Father. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. Right? None of us have, no one has ever seen God in all of his glory. No one has ever seen God, even though Isaiah saw him, even though uh, Moses saw him, even though Samson's parents saw him, they didn't see him in all of his glory or they wouldn't have been able to live. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus, God the Son, comes clothed in flesh. Eternal spirit takes on flesh and blood and comes to show us what God is like in a way that we can see. We can't see God in all of his glory unveiled or we would die, but God loves us so much that he comes veiled in flesh to Godhead see, as the Christmas hymn says, so that we could see him. Turn to another passage in the book of John. John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and verse 37 and following. This is a beautiful and, and tragic chapter. Um, actually, back up to verse 36. But the testimony that I have, that I have is greater than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father is sending so that you and I can see what God is like. Verse 37, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Okay, remember we talked in the past that those in the Old Testament were looking forward in faith to the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, and were saved. In the life of, you and I look back at the coming of Jesus and are saved, but in the life of Jesus, you've got these people who they've already been looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, so they're already what we would call saved. So then whenever Jesus comes on the scene, they recognize him. Oh, he's the Messiah. <coughs> But the religious leaders of the day were faking it. They pretended to worship God, but they didn't. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, they don't recognize him. They're not his sheep. They don't know his voice. And so verse 39, he says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Notice he wants them to come to him, but they're refusing I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And again, these religious leaders, if they had really believed, if they really believed the words of Moses, had been looking forward to the coming of Messiah, they would have recognized Jesus when he came. But they weren't. They were just, if you will, plain church. They were just using religion as a, a weapon or as a tool to gain power or, or money or, or fame, whatever it may be, fill in the blank. It wasn't sincere for them. They didn't have 
pure hearts. But Jesus comes, and even these who are his, uh, against him as his enemies, he's wanting them to come to him, and yet they're refusing. But he's come to show them the Father. Turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, look at verses 6 to 11. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Notice that, have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So Jesus comes to show us the Father so that we can look at him and understand what our Heavenly Father is like. God the Son comes. Of course, God the Holy Spirit is empowering this whole thing. And so now this God that we couldn't see, we're able to see and behold his glory. The God that only a couple have got to see, um, see him in his veiled glory. Now you and I, everyone that was there for the ministry of Jesus got to see him come close in a way that explained the Father in a way that they hadn't been able to see before. Um, one other passage for here, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. But notice that he was manifested in the flesh. The prize is seeing God. The problem is our sin. The path is Jesus. And he comes to show us the Father in a way that we can see and understand. And we see his grace and truth. The second thing with long Jesus coming to be in our path is this. Jesus is the sacrifice that makes it possible for us to have a new heart. It makes it possible for us to have a new heart. There's a couple of passages from Ezekiel I could, I could read, but let me just um, focus on one here. Ezekiel 36. Um, actually, I hate to skip it. Let me back up. Ezekiel 11. Go to Ezekiel 11 first. Ezekiel 11. Chapter 19, or verse 19 to 20. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. The same Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Turn over to chapter 36. You and I who, who need new hearts. Ezekiel 36, look at verses 26 to 27. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So Jesus comes and makes on the cross the sacrifice of himself. We've talked about this so many times, but remember the Old Testament law that none of us could keep. Jesus comes in flesh. He keeps the law for us so that he can be our substitute at the cross. And he takes all of our sin on himself and the death it deserves so we could have the gift of his righteousness and eternal life that goes with it. If we just believe, we've called upon his name for salvation, Believe that he is God who came and died and rose again for us. as a sin that he coming again. We call on him for salvation. He saves us in that moment. I love the story. You've heard me quote the verse so many times. Of the man who said, God be merciful to me a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went home justified. All right? And God gives us a new heart. Turn over to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians.
and look at chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, because he had to be able to keep it for us, right? Born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son, watch this, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You and I have been given new hearts through Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Seeing God as the prize, the problem was our sin, but the path is Jesus. And by faith in him, we have new hearts that the Holy Spirit lives in us. We are now his temple. We have these new hearts, first of all, in, in position. Those who have saving faith in God's love will see God in his glory in eternity. We will see God in his glory in eternity. Now, what degree of level is that? Let me just we'll look at some verses together. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to say too little. Let's just look at the verses together. Turn back to the book of Job. Job is not the first book in the Bible, but it was the first written in the Bible. It's the oldest book. It was actually written even before Genesis. Uh, Job 19. And here's this most ancient of books in the scripture. Job, in the midst of his trials, look what he says. Job 19, and verse 23. Oh, that my words were written. Guess what, Job? They are now. <laughs> oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. <coughs> oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. Watch this. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last day he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. Isn't this amazing? In the oldest book in Scripture, Job says, I'm going to die, but I know there's going to be a resurrection. That's what he's saying. In my flesh, I will see the Lord. That's hope, y'all. That's hope. We've called upon the name of the Lord for salvation, and he's given us the gift of a pure heart before him in our position because our sins have been washed away. The Holy Spirit has come to indwell us. Now we are his temple. When we have a pure heart, this gift of salvation, you have the guarantee that someday your eyes will see the Lord. You will have a resurrected body. You won't just be a spirit floating around like Casper the ghost. You will have a resurrected body, and your eyes will see God. What a blessed thing. What a day to look forward to, the hope that this produces. The hope that this produces. There's another thing this produces. And that's holiness. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verses 1 to 3. 1 John, 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears... We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And whatever John means, whenever he sees as he is, that's the level that we'll be able to see God at. So at least in some of his glory, if not in all of his glory, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. 
and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. When we know that one day we're going to be free from sin because we're going to see him as he is and he's sinless. And when we see him, there's something about seeing him that transforms us. When you have that hope, it's motivation to live in purity of life even now. That's in our practice. Our position is we've been given a new heart. But now, even now, in our practice, we're to live out that new heart. Now, we won't have time to get into the rest of this, but Lord willing, next week we'll be looking at this practice of what does it look like to have a pure heart now? What is it, not just positionally having a pure heart, but what does it look like to live in a pure heart even now? And what does seeing God even now in that look like? But for now, understand that it's faith in Jesus that allows you that someday you will, with your eyes, see God. You will. And what a glorious day that will be. And having that hope is motivation to obey him now. I, had a, I have a friend um, named Chris Thiessen, who's a writer down in Nashville, and he had a post on Facebook this week. Um, they, I think at first a few people misunderstood, but he explained what he meant, and a couple of others of us chimed in uh, talking about it as well. And what he said is this. Um, he was talking about, I think, some of his background, and he was talking about how it can be difficult to unlearn, to unlearn that Christianity is not about morality. Now, what he meant was this. You and I don't just focus on, let me do the right thing and not do the wrong thing. That's not Christianity. That doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Christianity is, like Hebrews says, of fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're not focused on, oh, morality, let me be the best person I can be. We're focused on the master. And when we're focused on the master, that will produce morality. That's the fruit. Our focus is on seeing God. And in Jesus, we see the Father. And we, we have the promise that we're going to see him even more. And as we're abiding in him, that dependence that we've talked about, moment by moment, relying on Jesus within us to show us how to respond in a situation, to give us his power, to give us his wisdom. Guess what? Morality gets produced. But the focus isn't on that. The focus is on the master and seeing him. When we have, that's a pure heart. Are we focused on him? Is he our highest prize, our highest goal? We're to love him with everything we've got. And I don't want to get ahead of myself in the next week, but we're to love him with everything we've got. And when we do, we're going to be like him. And the fruit will be there. The morality will be there. But it's a byproduct of focusing on Jesus, of seeing him. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you. What a wonderful promise that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And Lord, none of us are pure in heart on our own. We're just not. But you came. Jesus, you left heaven and came to earth to show us the Father. Jesus, if we've seen you, we've seen the Father because you and the Father are one. We thank you that the Holy Spirit empowers all of this and the Trinity works in harmony. Lord, thank you for the glimpses we see of you in Jesus. We thank you for the glimpses we see of you in your word. It's your word that testifies of you, Jesus, and it's in you that there's salvation. The scriptures are there to point us to you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to see you, to guarantee that someday our eyes will see you. And even now, may we cherish the glimpses that we have of you. May we let our focus on you, our belief in your love for us, transform our hearts to love you. And out of that love for you, that pure heart that loves you, may we obey you. 
and show your love to the world around us that they may see you. You are the greatest vision. In Jesus' name. <clears throat>